Hey everyone. So uh, if you don't know who I am, I'm uh, Mr. G. I'm the IB history teacher here at school. Uh, and I wanted to take a minute and break down the current events going on in the Middle East from a historical perspective. Uh, unfortunately, um, a couple of years ago when uh, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, I did a very similar video of the historical breakdown of the events that were transpiring. And um, that helped a lot of people kind of understand the background of what was going on so they could formulate their own opinion. And that's exactly what I want to do here as well. Right. So. I'm going to try my hardest not to come at this in any kind of bias way. Uh, I'm not going to try to dictate to you a certain opinion. I am literally only going to talk about the history of what has been going on in the territory that I'm going to call Israel-Palestine so that you can kind of better understand exactly what is going on in the news right now so you can formulate your own opinion and your own stance. Um, but before I get into it, I want to set like a very kind of basic ground rule about how I'm going to approach this situation. Uh, uh, rule number one or context number one, however you want to kind of think about it. Uh, um, you can be pro-Palestine and anti-Hamas because they are not the same thing. Uh, that is a very large misconception, unfortunately, going on uh, in, in many uh, places around the world right now that they think that all Palestinians are part of Hamas. And that is just not true. You can be pro-Palestine and anti-Hamas. And in the same vein, uh, you can be pro-Israel um, and the Israeli people, but you could be uh, you can condemn the actions of the Israeli government right now in places like Gaza. Right. So that is kind of the, the rule set that I want to give here as I talk about this. So if we uh, if you come into my room and we have a conversation or you have a conversation with other people, hopefully that is how you are also going to approach this situation. All right. So that's kind of my starter, my, my disclaimer, if you will. Um, and now let's get into a little bit of the history of it. Right. Um, I'm going to go through three different topics here to, again, just try and build this kind of educational framework, the historical framework, so that you can approach what's going on in the news uh, with more knowledge behind you. And that's that's the goal here, right? I'm, I'm trying to educate as best I can. Um, so topic number one is religion, right? This is a very religiously influenced, religiously motivated conflict. And I just want you to understand kind of the basics of the religions that go into this. All right. So religion number one is Judaism. Um, Judaism is going to kind of set the table as one of the earliest monotheistic religions that we have. Uh, essentially, we have a group of people who are you know, later going to become known as the Jewish people. Um, and uh, they get through several different prophets uh, messages from God himself. Right. And those messages are going to be about how to live your life, how to, you know, pay homage to God, uh, 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 all of these different things that kind of make up the basis of the Jewish religion. Right. Um, essentially. The Jewish people are going to write down uh, uh, what they've learned from these prophets um, and, 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 and how to establish their religion. And they're going to write down a book that they reference as the Torah. Right. So we've got the first religion in the series of three religions that I'm going to talk about. And that's uh, uh, the Jewish religion. And their book is the Torah. Right. Fast forward a little bit. We've got uh, a man that was born a Jew. Right. He was a practicing Jew his entire life. Um, but he is going to get a message from God as well. All right. And he is going to say, I've got an updated message from God that either uh, the original Jewish people have less, left some things out or God has noticed some things that he's not that happy with. And, and here's the updated outlook on what to think. All right. That man's name was Jesus Christ. Um, uh, after Jesus dies, uh, the people that followed him, his apostles, are going to write down all of his teachings and they are going to make a new book, all right, uh, a new religion based around that man, and it's Christianity, okay? Um, Christianity, like Judaism, uh, comes in a lot of shapes and forms in modern day society, but this is the basis of a bunch of different religions that are technically under that umbrella of Christianity, right? Um, if you are a Christian, you refer to that book as the Bible. 
uh, you recognize everything that the Jewish people did before and what they wrote down is called the Old Testament and what you, what uh, uh, Jesus's apostles wrote down is called the New Testament. Both of those things make up the Bible. So the Christian religion recognizes the Jewish religion, right? If you are Jewish, you recognize that Jesus Christ is a person, but you don't believe he got an updated message from God, okay? Fast forward a little bit more, and we've got another prophet who gets more messages from God, and that prophet's name is Muhammad. All right. Uh, Muhammad is going to teach his teachings about God's new updated message. After he dies, um, his kind of followers are going to write down all of Muhammad's teachings in a new book called the Quran. All right. Um, and that is going to be the foundation of the religion Islam. And again, just like I said about Christianity and Judaism before it, in modern day world, there are many different shapes and sizes of what it is to practice uh, 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 the Islamic religion. But that's just the foundation of it. Right. So if we really look at it, all three of these religions, right, three of the larger religions in the world, more practiced religions in the world, they're not the top three, but three of the larger ones all stem from the exact same story, all stem from the exact same God. All right. That is a message, I think, that gets lost over time. And people who practice these three religions think that they're vastly different than someone else. And at the end of the day, all three of these people caught messages from the same God. They interpret their messages very differently. So that's really what it all boils down to. And you might be asking, why is this guy talking about religion? Um, so if we get to background number two, that might make a little bit more sense. All right. So let's talk a, a little bit about the geography of the territory that, again, I'm going to refer to as Israel-Palestine. Okay. So um, Israel, Palestine is a country in the Middle East. It's a territory in the Middle East. And if you look at some of its neighbors, let me get my pen out here, right? It is right here. Okay. So that's the area known as Israel, uh, uh, Israel, Palestine. Um, it is surrounded by some major Middle Eastern powers, major Middle Eastern countries. We've got Egypt over here. We've got Saudi Arabia, we've got Iraq, we've got Iran, we've got Syria directly to the north. And then we've got a much larger country that isn't necessarily totally in the Middle East, but also Turkey as well, right? So it's surrounded by some pretty major countries. And that's no knock on uh, Jordan and Lebanon, which are uh, bordering uh, Israel, Palestine as well. Um, especially if you look at the news right now, you might hear a lot more about a country like Lebanon and how it's going to have an influence in the modern day situation. But I'm not here to get into the modern day. I'm here to talk about the history. So that is where Israel, Palestine is located in the greater context of the Middle East, right? Uh, now, uh, this is the territory of Israel, Palestine as well. Um, and it, uh, again, if you go back to kind of background number one, the reason that I talked about religion here um, is very important in this region. So if we look at this place right here, all right, uh, Jerusalem is a very, very, very holy city to all three of those major religions, right? Um, uh, both uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all have a very basic foundation, uh, kind of their origin stories all come from this part of the world. So all three religions are very tied to this area, which is why this territory has huge religious implications, right? Because all three have major cities or regions that are super important to the basis of their religion. All right. So you have to kind of understand religion to understand why this territory is as controversial and as sought after as it currently is. Okay. Um, so that's Jerusalem. There are other major cities, right, um, that kind of fall into this story as well. Jerusalem is one that I'm going to focus on. This entire region right here is going to be something that we currently refer to as the West Bank, and that has a lot of holy cities inside of it, okay? Topic number three, 20th century. All right, this is my specialty. Um, if you take my course, IB History here at school, um, these are going to be topics that we talk about a lot. 
Um, if you've taken my course, you might these might ring bells as to things that we've discussed and might be kind of further knowledge uh, into how it fits into the modern day world. Um, I could go back uh, until kind of the beginnings of time and, and uh, uh, more early human history and the, and, and the Dark Ages and the Crusades and all of that stuff. But this would be an hour long video and I don't want to do that because, um, again, I want to make it uh, as, as short and sweet as possible. Uh, I want to bring the most up to date information. And I think that is 20th century history. So, again, you can make educated decisions on your opinion. And it's my specialty. And I'm, you know more comfortable talking about this. So I figured that's what I would focus on. All right. So when we talk about this, uh, the, the state of Israel and the territory of Israel, Palestine, we have to go back to World War One to really get a foundation of what's going on. All right. Um, uh, prior to World War One, the territory of the Middle East all kind of fell under a, a collapsing empire called the Ottoman Empire. OK, um, uh, also prior to World War One, we've got a, a new movement that's going to emerge and it's called the Zionist movement. And if you're a Zionist, you are a person who wants a Jewish homeland. All right. And you want that Jewish homeland to be in the territory called Israel, Palestine. All right. Um, unfortunately for the Jewish people, kind of everywhere they've been throughout history, they've been heavily prosecuted and thrown out of the places that they lived. So your Zionist really wants a Jewish homeland governed by Jewish people so that they could feel safe to practice their own religion away from prosecution. All right. Um, now, fast forward a little bit into World War One. World War One is a terrible, terrible war. Um, uh, both sides of the war, both from kind of a, a, a German perspective as well as a British and French perspective, they both thought this war was going to end relatively quickly, and it doesn't. And it turns into a super bloody war, uh, something in class that we call a war of attrition, a war of resources. So it's very slow, very drawn out. Um, the British are looking for kind of any um, uh, uh, kind of uh, edge that they can get to defeat the Germans in this war. All right. So in 1917, um, British Foreign Secretary Arthur James Balfour, I always want to call him Grant. I don't know why. But Arthur James Balfour is going to um, write a letter to the head of the Zionist movement at the time. Uh, uh, his name was Lord Rothschild. Uh, and he is going to say that the British people totally support this idea of a Zionist movement and after the war want to help them get that Jewish homeland in um, Israel, Palestine. Uh, the British are going to do this for monetary reasons, right? Uh, they're fighting a war of resources. They could use any money that they could get to help them win that war against the Germans. Um, so they are going to promise that land to the Jewish people after the war if the Zionist movement can help them with kind of funding for the war, right? That whole chain of events is called the Balfour Declaration. And it's really at the centerpiece of the modern day issue going on there now. So you kind of have to understand that, laying that groundwork, that framework to understand what's going on right now. Uh, here is a picture of the, uh, uh, the letter written by um, Balfour to Lord Rothschild. All right. Uh, at the same time, um, the British kind of double dip the chip a little bit and they get involved into two separate groups of people. All right. Um, so I told you the Ottoman Empire is modern day Turkey. So if I were to go back to that map, it's a little bit north of the territory of Israel, Palestine. And that whole region was formerly run by the Ottoman Empire. Right. So if we fast forward to the war, uh, prior to the war, the Ottoman Empire in class, we call them the dying old man of Europe, right? It's an empire that is on the verge of collapsing in on itself. So as World War I broke out, the British thought that it would be kind of easy in that area of the world. And it turns out to be anything but that. The Ottomans put up very, very, very solid resistance to anything that the British were trying to do in kind of the Mediterranean, in the Middle Eastern region of the world. All right. Um, there's a major battle in World War One called the Battle of Gallipoli. It's also called the Battle of the Dardanelles Straits, the Straits of, of Turkey, right? Um, and the British take a huge military loss here. If you look at um, <clears throat> the Battle of Gallipoli, that's Winston Churchill's. That was supposed to be his crowning moment. He was uh, admiral in the Navy at the time. 
and he comes up with the plan of what to do there and it's a huge loss <clears throat> a huge loss for the british so they're kind of scrambling about what to do in that part of the world so they are going to approach the arab people all right and uh they are going to ask the arab people to start their own wars for self-determination and independence from the ottoman empire and the british figure that if the ottoman empire has to now fight the arab world they're not going to be able to contribute to the world war one itself and that's going to be a huge advantage for the british and the french as they're trying to defeat the germans okay um and they kind of promised the Arab world all of this land and independence and self-determination after the war at something called the Paris Peace Conference. Um, but they don't really give it to them, right? Um, they don't give them everything that they wanted because at the same time, uh, the British and the French agree on something called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, all right? And this is where Britain and France very, very, very secretly are going to agree to carve up the Middle East, right? The Middle East had not been colonized yet uh, because it was part of the Ottoman Empire for, for a very, very, very long period of time. And the British and the French see this new kind of opportunity to gain resources, gain influence, gain new markets in the Middle Eastern region of the world. So you've got two ambassadors and they're going to come up with this agreement about how to carve up the area that we currently call the Middle East. Not really recognizing the fact that uh, a little while ago they promised some of that land to the Jewish people and they also promised some of that land to the Arab people, that this the, the Islamic people, right? So uh, Britain kind of promised that land to too many people, but then at the end of the day, very secretly had plans for that land the entire time, all right? The sykes Picot Agreement, again, it was super secret. Uh, uh, the, the Zionists and the Arab people did not know that this was a thing. After the war, uh, you've got this new organization called the League of Nations, um, and they've got a system called the Mandate System. And the Mandate System was to try and help protect kind of uh, 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 undiscovered parts of the world or, or unestablished parts of the world and help them kind of catch up with what the modern world looked like at the time. And uh, uh, the League of Nations run by Britain and France are going to award a lot of this territory as mandates to Britain and France. So at the end of the day, the sykes picot Agreement was achieved through the mandate system of the League of Nations. We talk about the mandate system a little bit more um, exclusively in class in year one of the course that I teach. But places like Syria, Lebanon, uh, Jordan are all going to kind of be given to the British and the French as, uh, uh, as mandates, all right? Fast forward uh, a little bit, skipping a good chunk of history here, but again, getting to the uh, the most important parts, uh, we've got the Holocaust. And obviously the Holocaust is going to be a, uh, a planned genocide of 6.5, 6.6 million Jewish people by the Nazi regime in Germany, all right? Um, uh, a mass extinction event for the Jew European Jewish population. And after the war, uh, that Zionist movement is going to catch a lot of momentum, rightfully so, because they want a homeland where they can feel safe uh, to try and recover their population from the atrocities of the Holocaust that just happened. So in 1947, building off that Balfour Declaration from prior to World War I, the uh, United Nations this time is going to uh, give a partition, so uh, propose a partition of land in Israel-Palestine to the Jewish people. All right. Um, the plan, the original, uh, um, the original partition looks just like this, right? Modern day Israel, Palestine does not look like this, but this is the original solution by the United Nations. If you notice, uh, the Jewish people have land, the Palestinians have land, and Jerusalem is this kind of uh, a city that is not governed by anyone because it is too important to be governed by any one religion because it's so important to all three of those, those foundation religions that I talked about in part one of the video, okay? Uh, the Jewish population completely agrees to this partition. The Arab world completely disagrees with this partition. And that's going to lead to a ton of tension between those two groups of people. And it's going to lead to the first uh, Arab-Israeli war. All right. Now, uh, disclaimer as I come to this part. 
post World War II is a period of time known as the Cold War. Uh, and the Cold War is this ideological conflict between the United States and capitalism and the Soviet Union and communism. The Cold War has a ton of implications in the modern day Middle East. Again, I'm going to make a, a, an executive decision not to cover that stuff exclusively here because, again, the video would be very, very, very long and very it's already long and it would be even more confusing than it already is. Just know that any time after World War II, America and the Soviet Union have an increased presence in this part of the world, especially in the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, and that influence that those two superpowers are going to have are going to lead to a rise of radical Islamic groups. All right. Not all Muslims are radical Islamics. That's not what I'm trying to say. But it's going to lead to a rise in radical Islamic thinking because you've got America and the Soviet Union kind of thrusting their own beliefs into that area of the world and a group of people resist it and become more uh, 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 radically thinking to protect their own religious beliefs. OK, so just know that that's going on in the background as I'm talking about other stuff. All right. Um so in 1947, we're going to have the first Arab-Israeli war. Again, because of those Cold War tensions, America is going to align itself very closely to the Israelis. Uh, Israel is America's closest ally um, in the Middle East and one of their closest allies in the world in general. Um, and because of the backing of the Western world that Israel has, it becomes very, very, very profound militarily. So they are going to win the first Arab-Israeli war quite easily. Um, and that is going to lead to conquering more territory that once belonged to the Palestinians. Now they're part of Israel. And that's going to lead to the displacement and a refugee crisis of almost a million Palestinians that are now trying to move out of their former homes into new territory. So the displacement of these Palestinians is going to cause a, a, a lot of tension within the area as they're going to neighboring countries like Egypt and Jordan and Syria and Lebanon. Uh, it's, it's going to create problems for the Palestinian people. Um, uh, uh, finding a, a, a homeland, right? Um, just note that one of the places that a lot of these Palestinians are going to go to, if you look at this map, is this area over here that, again, we can kind of call the West Bank later on, and this area here that we currently call the Gaza Strip, right? So that's where some of these Palestinians are going to begin to take uh, 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 refuge after the first Arab-Israeli war, okay? So... Let's move on. Um, the Suez Crisis. So this is 1956. This is one of those things that I don't want to get too down into the rabbit hole of uh, because essentially this is one of those Cold War uh, uh, crises, right? This is a Cold War situation that is very, very, very nuanced. But essentially you've got um, uh, a conflict over the Suez Canal, right? Now, the Suez Canal is one of the most important waterways in the entire world, and the Suez Canal is in Egypt, all right? Egypt being part of the greater uh, uh, um, Arab world, the greater Middle Eastern world, okay? Um, so essentially, you've got a situation where uh, uh, England and um, France are going to try and increase their control over the Suez Canal. Um, there are things going on internally in Egypt that are not allowing England and France to freely trade using the Suez Canal, and they don't want that, right? No one wants to pay money to trade through such a major waterway. Um, so they try and figure out a way to make Israel look like they are being the aggressor in this region right here, all right? This is technically Egyptian land. It's called the Sinai Peninsula, all right? So they want Israel to kind of like make a mess and Britain and France are going to come and clean it up. And because they clean it up, they kind of get to trade freely in the Suez Canal. Um, that's the background of the Suez crisis. Even though it's a Cold War thing, America and the Soviet Union have nothing to do with this. This is Britain and France acting kind of independently of the, the superpowers at the time, okay? Um, 
The Suez crisis, I, I skipped too quickly there. The Suez crisis is going to end with a lot of the Arab world being angry with not only the, Britain, the British and the French for causing this, but also the Israelis for the stance they took at the beginning of the crisis. And that is going to fast forward into uh, the Six Days War. All right. So there is a lot of tension in the Middle East between the Arab world and the, and the, 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 uh, the state of Israel uh, that carries over from the Suez crisis. And it leads us to our kind of second major war in the region and that's the six six days war all right um essentially it is kind of egypt is at the center of this again holding on to some of that tension left over from the suez crisis and they are going to try and block israeli trade um um throughout kind of the rest of the region all right um as a response to the uh, aggression by the egyptians here israel is going to launch an airstrike on egyptian airfields again israel is militarily the strongest country in that region so if they are activated militarily uh, they're probably going to have the upper hand in that conflict. And just by name alone, the Six Days War, you can imagine that this isn't the largest military conflict of all time. Uh, the Israelis have a pretty easy street here uh, uh, to a win. All right. And that win is going to lead to very, very, very different borders in the Middle East now. All right. So uh, as you could see on my kind of graphic here, Israeli state before the war, Israeli state after the war, right? Um, uh, in 1967, the United Nations is going to help uh, broker a ceasefire, which is great. Uh, but at the end of the day, the Israeli state is going to capture a ton of territory specifically from Egypt that um, – uh, that really, again, sets off a lot of tensions they're going to trigger in the region. They're going to be very hard to fix, right? A ceasefire doesn't fix tensions. It fixes the fighting, right? So the problems that are existing in the Middle East uh, are, are amplified. Um, they're not fixed yet. And uh, the Arab world is, is, is suffering because the Israelis are winning these conflicts, okay? Um, the occupation that Israel has in some of this territory, again, is going to most negatively in, uh, influence the Palestinian people, right? Because now they took more land in, again, that place that we call the West Bank and the place that we call the Gaza Strip, and Palestinians live there, but Israelis are, are having an increased presence in those regions because of their military conquest, right? So the Palestinian peoples are once again refugees and once again do not necessarily have a place that they can settle down and grow on their own, okay? Next, this is a big deal, uh, in 1973. So again, these are those tensions that are not being fixed, right? A ceasefire does not fix tensions. Um, in 1973, we've got the Yom Kippur War. All right. Uh, if you are a Jewish person, you know that Yom Kippur is one of your high holidays. If you're not a Jewish person, I just told you, uh, Yom Kippur is one of the high Jewish holidays. So uh, at a time period where the Jewish population in Israel and the Jewish military kind of lets its guards down to celebrate, again, a very holy uh, uh, day for them, a, a very holy celebration, uh, the Arab world is going to launch another attack on the Israeli state. Again, kind of led by Egypt, and this time Syria is a little bit more involved as both of them are looking to gain back territory that they lost in the Six Days War prior. Okay, so Egyptian and uh, Syrian uh, forces are going to attack the Israelis during Yom Kippur, again, hence the name Yom Kippur War. And they are going to get off to a very, very, very quick start because, again, the Israelis are not expecting this attack. Uh, the Arab-Israeli War is going to help kind of uh, uh, justify or fix, or I not, shouldn't say justify, help right some of the territorial uh, gains that Israeli made during the last war, right? Um, essentially, America and the Soviet Union, they're also going to be kind of involved in this conflict because, again, it does get rather large. This is probably the largest of the wars um, in the Arab-Israeli uh, 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 world. Um, up to this point in time, uh, the UN again steps in and, and uh, negotiates a ceasefire. 
Um, and we're going to see, again, if you look at our map here, the territory is going to return to more like the territory we saw prior to the Six Days War than we saw after the Six Days War, right? So places like Egypt, places like Syria get some of their home territory back, which is great for them. But again, the Palestinians are kind of uh, left, a lot of them are left without a home from this war as well, because not all Palestinian territory is, retur is returned to Palestine. All right. Um, out of all this, I've mentioned this territory a lot. This is the Gaza Strip. So geographically, this is where it is. It is technically kind of sandwiched in the middle of the Mediterranean, Israel and Egypt. Um, uh, the Gaza Strip is home to a lot of Palestinians. All right. It was home to uh, some people of the Jewish population, especially after the Six Days War. Uh, but after the Yom Kippur War, we see a lot of the Jewish population move out of Gaza and it becomes almost exclusively Palestinian land. OK, so um, we've got a lot of changing of people who live in the Gaza Strip throughout all of these conflicts that are going on in the Middle East. All right. Now, this is Hamas. All right. This is kind of a key player in the conflict that we're currently talking about. All right. Uh, I mentioned that because of Soviet and American influence in the region, you're going to have a large rise in radical Islamic thought. Again, that's not to say that all people who practice Islam, all Muslims are radical. That's not what I'm trying to say. But you've got a a subset of that population who, in order kind of to defend their religious beliefs, takes on a very uh, a radical, a very ultra nationalistic persona um, uh, to try and protect themselves. Right. Uh, we see this kind of pop up all over the Middle East in different shapes and sizes. Uh, some of these groups become very successful. Some of these groups become very unsuccessful in achieving their goals. Hamas is definitely one of the larger radical Islamic groups. All right. Uh, if you're in the West, you might call them a terrorist group. Even in, if you're in the Middle East, you might refer to them as a terrorist group. But kind of a, a more comfortable definition is that they are a radical Islamic group. Okay. Uh, one of the key pillars of Hamas is they want to rid Palestine of uh, 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 Israeli people, of Jewish people. They don't want them there anymore. They want an Arab state run by Arabs, run by them. OK, um, so in 2006, in that Gaza Strip kind of area, Hamas is going to win a large political representation in, in the government of that region. So ever since 2006, Hamas has kind of controlled the Gaza Strip because of their not only kind of military presence, but also because of their political presence in that region as well. All right. Uh, they also control a good chunk of that West Bank. That's not as prominent in the current day conflict as Gaza is. So that's why I'm kind of focusing on Gaza. As Hamas increases their kind of control over Gaza, Israel becomes more and more worried because, again, one of the key pillars of Hamas is to rid the Middle East of the Israeli state. OK. Um, because Israel is so kind of concerned, uh, either justify, justifiably or unjustifiably so, that's your decision to make, um, they do a lot of kind of preemptive measures in terms of blockading and, and putting up barriers between Israel and the Gaza Strip because, again, of that increased Hamas presence there. Um, so literally since 2006, Gaza is one of the poorest regions in the world um, because of the the kind of takeover of Hamas in that region, as well as the the uh, response to the increased Hamas presence by the Israelis. All right. So it's very, 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 very hard to get um, to get food, to get good medicine, to get education, to get health care care in that area. And even with aid to the Gaza Strip from either Arab nations or from the Western world or whoever is giving it to them, it's still a very, very, very deeply impoverished place. That brings me up to the current day situation. Again, my goal here was not to cover this, right? I debated it kind of all weekend, all week, as I was putting together this that I wanted to share with you guys. My goal here was to spread education in terms of the historical context that's going on in the region, not to talk about what's going on today. 
Uh, um, I'm hoping that if you're genuinely curious about what's going on in the Middle East right now, um, that you can go on any news outlet, right? Any news outlet and read for yourself. And hopefully because of this video, you have enough background knowledge to understand more of the nuances of what's going on. So you can make a more educated opinion, uh, educated guess, an educated opinion, right? An educated stance on the current day issues. Um, at the end of the day, I want to add a little bit of my own two cents. I'm pro human here. Uh, I think that, um, no one is winning because people and ch especially children are dying. And I hope this whole problem gets fixed very, 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 very quickly. I don't know what the fix is. Um, I'm, you know, that's not my area of expertise. I just hope that kind of uh, humans win and this whole uh, conflict gets resolved and no more people die. Uh, no more children have to suffer like this. So at the end of the day, I'm pro-human. And uh, that's my official stance on everything going on in the Middle East right now. Um, uh, for my kind of last send off here, again, I hope you learned something. I hope that you're more empowered uh, uh, about what's going on from this video. Uh, if you've got questions um, uh, about anything I said and want to learn more about it, please stop by my room. Uh, please talk with, you know, other people, right? We've got uh, we've got Muslims in this school. We've got uh, uh, people who are Jewish in this school. Have conversations, right? Uh, uh, hopefully you all have a good ground to build off of. And uh, again, formulate your own opinion, have conversations, because essentially that's the only way we're going to fix problems like this is with your generation being more empowered and uh, hopefully solving these problems in the future. All right. Again, I hope you learned something. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. And again, I hope humanity kind of wins at the end of the day.